Hi, this is Rod Gels from the Rock Band Program Podcast, and we are here with Jason Schaefer of Full Tilt, was it Full Tilt Productions, Studios, whatever. I just got the Full Tilt Productions is kind of what I'm going with. Okay, so Jason, lifetime musician. He's a producer. He's an engineer. He he gets, you know, he records people. That's what he does. (laughs) But he has a story. Jason has a story. We want to get it. We want to get your story today. Okay. So with the whole music scene and all the whole music thing, where did your, where did your, what are your earliest memories of music? Like how did music get into your life? Uh, I'd probably have to go all the way back to like when I found my mom's record collection, you know, her like 45s and stuff like that. And um, just got obsessed with, you know, a lot of the stuff I found there, which was like CCR and Johnny Cash and the Beatles. And that just kind of drew me in from that, that mm-hmm. point on of just loving music and just trying to start just knowing there was something more there than just at the surface level i guess yeah yeah yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. just listening like i i didn't know exactly what i was doing then but realizing that i was just getting really into like the nuances of the you know being like what's that sound and what's that you know yeah and, and that just kind of started my obsession and, and passion with with music yeah that's wonderful so what how old are we talking um wow i'm, I'm probably like eight nine something like that okay. you know um and then um then you I, took up then you took up the trumpet yeah yeah i was playing trumpet because you know they, they introduced um like band instruments and stuff like that in our school so i think it was like third and fourth grade uh and i think i did it like maybe three years i'd played okay. trumpet and then um you know by the time middle school rolls around and it was all the nirvana and green day stuff you know it was like okay like i love all this like classic stuff like i absolutely love it but like that being what was going on. This know, is right my generation. Back, yeah, this is like, you know, it's what I really, you know, felt and connected to at the time, you know, and kind of, um, you know, kind of just doing the whole like rebel thing as a kid, you know, like that was just kind of like the vibe I was into. Yeah. yeah. Um, and just got obsessed with all that stuff. And that's when I was like, okay, I need, I need guitar, you know, like I can't yeah. <laughs> play in trumpet anymore, which yeah. I wish looking back, I absolutely wish I would have stayed with the trumpet as well. Yeah. 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 You know, you know 13, 14 year old kid. One doesn't necessarily cancel out the other. So we have a similar, yeah. we have a similar history with the trumpet. With the, after all, there's no trumpet players in Kiss, but but uh, <laughs> I don't know if any, I don't know if our uh, listeners know that. But anyway, so <laughs> so you uh, was like around seventh grade, you got into guitar. How did you get? How did you get into this? Did did you, uh, did you have teachers? Did you? I, I think when I bought my guitar, um, I signed up for like three or four. Le- I think they even like threw them in at a discounted rate or something like that. Okay. And um, I, I went to those lessons and I think I continued them for like a month or two. But then like I just at that point, I started digging into l- learning stuff by ear and, and things like that. And like finding out what the chords are and, and you know, just, you know, at the time, we didn't, you know, I was getting those. um you know, rock and roll magazines, or I don't know what they, they were called anymore, you know, but they would have like a guitar for the practicing musician and guitar yeah, for you know, and they transcribe, you know, the tablature for like whatever four or five songs at the time, you know, it wasn't like I could just go out and look up stuff like you can now, but yeah, um, just a, an accumulation of all that. And then I kind of got away from doing the lessons as much. Mm-hmm. Um, well, and what was your teacher like? Um, I mean, Wayne Thompson, um, I mean, he's, he still teaches in the language. I know so, Wayne. I know. Oh, do you know Wayne? Yeah, yeah. I do. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So um, he was great. I mean, I love yeah. I love working with him and all that stuff. Um, yeah, he wasn't a fuddy-duddy because there's a lot yeah. of, you're not, you're not my age either because back when I started, teachers were like, they wanted to teach you what, what was the right way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the right way always meant that you couldn't do what you wanted to do yeah exactly yeah yeah, yeah, yeah wayne yeah. i don't wayne's not wayne's not that way no no he's great no i said i had a great experience with him and all that i think it was just at the time where i'm like okay like he gave me all the information that i was kind of asking for at the time and then i'm like okay like i'm just gonna kind of do my own own thing after a while and kind yeah, of yeah. doing it that way that's wonderful i didn't know you were you had a connection yeah. with wayne uh yeah 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 but that's also why sometimes i just say like i'm i'm a, a total hack when it comes to this stuff because i just kind of learned it a lot of it on my own and uh I don't know. You know, sometimes I, I think that's great. Other times I think having more of a actual education behind it is, is more helpful as well. <laughs> yeah. 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 But what we've uh, learned from this is the importance of a good ear and yeah, ear, yeah. An ear can get you somewhere. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 And yeah. Uh, I'm a big, you know, like 
gut feeling type of person as well you know i mean so when it comes to like producing and, and all that stuff like where some people use theory more to do that mm -hmm. um i just kind of more am more of a gut and like vibe feeling type of a person mm -hmm. and kind of going back to just using my ear like what sounds good is usually good you know yeah yep absolutely absolutely so when did you uh you're learning this stuff you're learning some nirvana you're learning some green day you're learning probably some beatles because you got some beatles in you yeah, yeah, you know, I was, yeah, I was learning all that classic Freedom. stuff too. Yeah, 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 yeah. But it was like when you you, you went over to like your friends' places to jam or whatever. You what know, were the like, songs that you would jam to? Well, I mean, like you know, obviously all the Green Day, Nirvana, Offspring, um, okay. you know, all that all that typical stuff. Um, you know, and sometimes I actually do remember playing a lot of Tom Petty at that point too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but um, but yeah, it seemed like that's what like, everybody was learning the same types of songs. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So like we were we were learning all like that '90s grunge stuff um the new, then, new standards yeah 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 we're still, we'll start talk, we're still talking about come as you are and smells like teen spirit and this is like oh yes yes absolutely yeah, all those 30 years later yeah yeah um but then like as things you know i'm like i want to join a band you know i want to like be in a band and, and like everybody was looking for more bass players at that point there was you know guitar players everywhere um where were you I'm, living where were you living uh in, in lancaster area lancaster okay. county yeah. I was going to say, how did you get reach Rick Wayne? Because that was a, I know. Oh, he, yeah. Well, I think that was um, Stephen Nicholas. Was, yeah, yeah, that's, that's where we, yeah, there. I taught, I taught at Stephen Nicholas York. Okay. Back okay. In, oh, and you said York? Or, yeah, they had oh. York, they had a York location and, and a Lancaster location. Okay. All right. So yeah, I went to yeah. the Lancaster one and um, yeah, it's, it's where I was taking my lessons for a while there, you know. Yeah. And then well, actually I ended up going to his apartment in Leola as well. Um, I forgot about that. I don't. I don't know if he stopped teaching there or like it was easier for. Oh, our went out of business, probably. Uh, oh, maybe. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But I remember there was a few. The last couple lessons I had with him was at his uh, apartment in in Leola. Okay. But then, um, but yeah, then at that point, everyone was looking more like you know the opening spots were for bass players. You mm -hmm. know, I'm like sure, like I'll play bass. You know. <laughs> like, yeah. And then after that, I just kind of got more obsessed with it you know where i'm mm -hmm. like oh i actually really really like this in, in some ways even more um than guitar you know? yeah who were who were some of the guys that you uh did you did you think in terms of idolizing people like these these are the guys i want to sound like i mean yeah i guess i mean back then it was probably just like that smaller you know kind of group of people i was saying about you know definitely you know the beatles and you know i was I, i'm paul mccartney is like definitely like the, <laughs> the, the my favorite beatle yeah um, um so i mean obviously his bass playing um i mean motown i mean i loved all of motown like all that growing up and to me that went you know along with like me listening to the more classic like 60s 70s music of course like motown's going to be lumped in there as well mm -hmm. yeah um so like i loved all that stuff but i mean i was obviously playing more like alternative rock you know um yeah. so i don't know i mean i don't know i mean i just there again like if, if it's whatever was common with with, with, me, your, with you know, your buddies you know? yeah yeah so i don't think i was really trying to like you know have somebody in mind and like trying to like you know imitate them or anything at, yeah. at that time you know but yeah so uh so this takes you through like your first bands were like kind of garage bands throughout high school yeah yeah i mean they're all like pretty similar i mean like there was i'd say there's you know a group of like 15 people that would kind of all have these bands going on and alternate between some of the members and you know there was you know a core group of people that kind of were always there um, but yeah, I just kind of jumped around from band to band, you know, like bands would last for a couple months, then you'd have their, something would have a falling out with somebody, you know, and next thing you know, there's a new band that's created, you know, mm -hmm. that's the mixture, you know, so you always, because you're a bass player, you always had a gig. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. 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 That's um, I don't yeah. think I really played guitar in a band until I went into college when I was in Florida at Full Sail. Okay. Uh, it was actually probably the first band I was in that I played guitar. guitar. All right. And that was all of a, it's more of an instrumental um, thing where we would just do all like cover songs of movie and TV show themes. Okay. Um, Cause now nobody let's, really- Let's talk about, okay. So you, okay. You're, you're, you're in high school and you have th th these really big thoughts about how cool music is. And now this is really what you want to invest your, 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 your heart in. And you, and this is what I want to do. You had a very yeah. real idea. You had a very real idea. You talked to your band director. Was it your band director? Yeah, in uh, in high school, Terry Gaiman. I don't know if you know um, him. He was in a band, a pretty big country band in the '90s in the area called Shucks. 
Okay. Um, and actually, my parents used to take me to see them at these like country carnivals and stuff like that when I was right. really super young. And the next thing I know, here's this guy is my music teacher. I'm like, I know this guy from this band. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But he gave me some of the best advice that has set me in the right direction and kind of, you know, where I am today, you know, within, you know, my, I think it was my junior and senior year of high school. Him and I talk a lot about the future of what I could do with music. Mm -hmm. And um, what, did, what did he tell you? Well, he knew at the time I was like really focusing on being like, I wanted to be like the musician. Like I wanted to be a musician on stage performing. And, um, you know, not that he was like trying to deter me away from that, but just kind of like somebody has been in the business for so long. Um, it's kind of like, you know, like the, with trends of music and, you know, just even being an artist that, you know, gets it to the point you can sustain a living sometimes is like hitting the lottery, you know, and like, you know, maybe you should try to look at doing behind the scenes things, you know, like the, the production work and the engineering where artists can, you know, come and go and have like their 15 minutes of fame. But if you're good at what you do behind the scenes, like you will have like job security in this industry. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that kind of like- need The need to diversify a little bit. Yeah, it made me look at things a little differently. Cause I think, you know, I had an ego back then. I think there's a lot of, you know, kids at that time period and you thought you were really good, you know, a lot better than what you were, you know. And, um, you know, thinking in my mind, like, oh yeah, I could be, a, I can join a band and we'll, will be great and you know, I can make a living out of this you know I think just having like that reality check from somebody like that and who I respect it you know as um you know a teacher and just a, a fellow you know kind of musician or somebody who's been doing it for years mm -hmm. um I was like you know that makes a lot of sense you know <laughs> so yeah. I kind of kind of got more interested in that in going that realm you know and I was already dabbling with recording and things like that so I kind of was already first, when did you first get into recording um, I mean, shortly after I got my first guitar, I had this um, karaoke like tape deck, a dual tape deck thing. Yeah. Um, so I'd record like a, I could record like a drum. I could do two inputs at one time and that would record the one one track. Um, so I'd record like a drum loop and guitar over that and then swap the tapes mm -hmm. and then hit play on the one tape and hit <laughs> record on the other tape. And I could record more tracks with that. So it was like a really like, you know, archaic way of doing multi-track recording that's what's um, wonderful about all this all these i'm doing these interviews and the people are like when we started it was the one track you just yeah <laughs> yeah 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 so i was just making these like silly little recordings and demos and things you know yeah. and really getting into doing that type yeah. of stuff um and then i think i bought like a four track you know a real cheap like four track tape recorder then around the same time that um the te you know my music teacher was telling me this stuff and i'm mm -hmm. like oh this all makes sense and i kind of dove into that a little bit further then and got a little bit more you know into the recording aspect and uh, started focusing on that that avenue a little bit more than just you know playing and being a musician yeah 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 so uh so this led to full sale university for those who don't know about full sale it is it teaches your production and um engineering and the whole art of recording what yeah, else what is, what else does it teach uh i mean i mean they're one thing that they really you know their catch or tagline or whatever is kind of they call it they say real world real world education um and i, I found that to be pretty true with like working in the industry and in the studio because we'd have class at like one o'clock in the morning like we'd have class times that are like 11 at night to three and then there's some classes that were like one to five in the morning and as ridiculous as that sounds like it kind of did prepare me to do this for, 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 real, for the real world yeah just being all over the place and kind of sporadic you know um and yeah just like really getting into like having that time in the studios and diving into the equipment and and the other classes they'd have with just like the book learning aspect mm -hmm. of it like it was just a really a real big crash course like a pretty intense well, what was the hardest what were the hardest classes for you oh or, wow i mean it's hard to even think back to them anymore it was such a blur to begin with i had i had acoustics when i was in college and there that's probably one of three cl classes i prayed to get through oh, really? <laughs> now, you're probably um, uh, given what you're you excel at you're probably way better at that stuff yeah um i had more of an issue with some of the electronics like the soldering stuff and all, all that type of stuff like because mm -hmm. i had like really no background in, in any of that so that was like all brand new to me okay um and i got really good at it then i actually ended up like 
ending that class really liking it and getting a really great grade in it but it was a struggle for me to to do right. all the stuff in the beginning you, you know? got to work at it yeah it was like the the signal flow and all the patch based stuff like that was the stuff like i ate all that stuff up like i sat there and loved all like doing all mm-hmm. that like the paper you know the tests and stuff they would give us and then like the because the, we do like paper tests but then they do like you know hands-on tests as well yeah so which like i said that to me was like i feel like sometimes you can go to school and get all this education sometimes but it's like learning how to apply it and i think that's oh, yeah, yeah. application really, that's yeah. that's why i left college to begin with it was the application i wasn't getting right away gotcha yeah 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 and um but that's what i think really clicked for me you know and, and not saying that all just came from school either. I mean, I interned for a good year and a half out of two, you know, two years before I really, I think that's when things really clicked for me in the studio world, like in that time frame. Yeah. But that foundation of full sale is what got me there quickly. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Okay. So you interned, where did you intern? Um, legit sound studios in Lancaster. Um, so after <laughs> college um i moved back with um my my parents and thinking that was the kind of the plan already already having this internship lined up with the studio that was about 15 or 20 minutes away from my parents house okay, so bill uh, like, grabowski bill grabowski yeah 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 which he's you know he's done a lot in the industry um he used to work with bon jovi back in like the 80s and stuff okay. like that he was like in their their camp you know during um i forget the album before slippery one wet but he was involved with that one pretty heavily like Fahrenheit, um, something Fahrenheit. Yeah, yeah, like seventy uh, or seven hundred. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Second Fahrenheit. album. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then he was from the Lancaster area and ended up, I think, you know, having a family and stuff like that. And it made sense. He built his own studio uh, in a little town called Brownstown. So that's actually, I mean, Brownstown is actually where I grew up in, like the little town there. Okay. Um, and then interned there for about a year, year and a half. Um, and just kind of built on what I had learned, you know, and, you know, actually being under somebody like him that's been in the in- industry for so long, you know, and just like watching what he did. And a majority of that first half of the internship was just watching what he did. You know, like I wasn't. That's, that's what I, that's what I always hear is like, uh, how did you get your start in music and, and like cleaning ashtrays? Oh yeah. Oh my God. Like I, I cleaned his toilets and everything. You know, you know what I mean? It's like yeah, yeah, yeah. they teach you how to, they teach you how to take care of the equipment and then yeah, you yeah. have to take care of the equipment. And back yeah. then for you, it was, was it ADAT? Well, no, he was using um, the radar system at that point, which I don't know. Like some people are really familiar with that. Other people are not. Okay. There's the big gap in between um, like tape recording, like digital and analog tape recording okay. and, and into like Pro Tools. So like okay. radar was like a totally standalone, like digital platform. Okay. But it was it was hard disk recording, but you it was 24 tracks, so it operated like a tape machine, but it had more editing capabilities than just what was prior to that before, like with okay. and, and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and actually, radar is still used in, in some bigger city studios in Nashville. Radar is still pretty big because their um, converters are still known as being some of the best okay. converters in in uh, you know in the industry. So it's still kind of used. But anyway, so he but, was using that. You- could you still use it do you think or is that like oh you could still totally use it yeah i mean it would still be up to today's you know i'm saying you would you have the ability to do it after all these years oh like get into it and actually do yeah. it um i'd probably need like a little bit of like i need a little time with it to get mm-hmm. but I, yeah it was pretty it was pretty nice like straightforward program yeah so that was legit sound in brownstown yeah yeah so you were there what a year and a half yeah, about about a year and a half to two years. A little that it's kind of. <laughs> if, you were, if you if you remember it, you weren't there. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it was kind of a transition period to where I started on the, on the second half of the internship. He kind of like realized that like okay, you're at the point where you can do some of this stuff by yourself. Like, so he opened up the door to like, saying like, if I had found people that you know wanted to work with me. Like he, like here's the rate I'm going to charge you for using the studio. You can do whatever you want after that. You know, I mean, yeah. here's like, what do you have to pay to use the studio? Bring in whoever you want, do whatever you want, charge you do it for free for experience, or you know, charge them you know fifteen dollars an hour or whatever you know, just yeah, yeah. something you know. Um, so I started doing a couple of projects like that just to get you know that was more of my experience of like okay now I've uh, I've accumulated all this knowledge. I feel yeah. like I kind of know what I'm doing, you know, but it's like okay this is like really like my first like sessions I'm doing. 
yeah, yeah. Some were just like mock, you know, mock sessions or something like that, like in in college or whatever. Yeah. Um, so I just did like a bunch who are, of them. who are some of the do you remember some of these people you one were? one of the very first ones was a, a a punk trio called Broken Toaster. Okay. Uh so I still yeah, I, I re, actually I did two albums with them uh in that time period. Um so I'd worked with them quite a bit. Um and there was another another punk band thing, I can't remember their name, but it was mostly that like that type of stuff, you know. I mean that kind of you know, just so were, were you talking in the late nineties? Well, no, this would have been like early 2000. Yeah, early 2000s. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, so I did that. And then eventually, um, through a mutual friend, um, that th they knew um, Robert Scott um, of Hybrid Ice and then had also um, opened a studio called um, Scott Ray. Well, the piano store was called Scott Ray Piano Gallery. Okay. And they had this extra room in the back, um, but they converted into a studio and they, they became Pro Tools dealers and all that stuff. So okay. they had, you know, pretty nice studio pretty quickly, you know, got got put together pretty quickly and they were looking for someone to to run it kind of. And what the, the guy, the, our mutual friend was like, hey, they're looking for this like, you know, younger guy that doesn't really have any responsibilities who can kind of like put his all his effort into like kind of running the studio a little bit. Um, and I'm like, all right, that sounds like a unique opportunity. That's kind of like what I'm potentially looking for, you know, because mm -hmm. honestly, when I went into to school and all that and decided to go for more of like the studio and production aspect, I didn't really have a plan of like what I was going to like. I never had the intention of opening my own studio. Yeah. It was just like, I just want to work with music. I want to be in music. I want to work in the studio. And at that time frame, to me, it was like, I'm going to work at somebody else's studio. Like, I hope yeah. I can be like an engineer or like a head engineer at somebody's studio. Mm -hmm. um, so given that opportunity, I'm like, well, that kind of sounds like what I want to do, you know? And it sounds like a good, you know, potentially good fit. Um, so I started going up there and I was still living in Lancaster at the time. Um, and just, I was commuting. So where was that? Um, what the the studio robert uh, hey, robert scott that was in new cumberland i started out in new cumberland okay, okay. Uh, and that was robert scott and bill ray they had owned that together okay um and i started commuting for about nine months i was coming you know i was like it doesn't make sense for me to move up here right away or i was like who knows yeah. like this may not even work out you know what i mean yeah. so um i was commuting for about nine months every day and then they also gave because our piano store they gave me the um option to get some extra money and extra hours to move pianos for them part-time as well mm -hmm. um so i was doing i'd go up in the mornings and um you know move pianos for about four or five hours and then go in the studio for another like eight or nine hours you know yeah. end up like driving home late at night and coming back early in the morning yeah uh, but that was you know that was pretty much my nine your life, months your, your life in the early 2000s yeah yeah and okay. then uh, when things got like pretty you know more solidified where i'm like oh this is going to be like consistent you know consistent work uh and i can actually see this going somewhere and plus i started doing like tons of late night sessions where you know i would i wouldn't be done in the studio until one or two o'clock in the morning and, I'm and you're like, not gonna drive home yeah so i ended up like sleeping in the studio <laughs> hey. and then at, at that point i'm like all right it makes sense to like just find some little cheap apartment to move into up here and at least yeah. start a new chapter and see where this goes yeah yeah i think the first time i met you and I, you don't remember this i'm sure was i was a fly on the wall to kill main saints uh it was a oh. your your place had burned it burned down oh my god yeah 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 so that okay, was so they you relocated you relo relocated the thing it was during i guess it was during one of the recordings that it was a fire yeah that was the first place i kind of went out my own you know out, out of um out of bob well then like the scott ray um studio that ended up moving to uh, mechanicsburg which ended up turning into after seven studios which, which was mm -hmm. just bob and i yeah um and then i kind of went out on my own uh at that point and i just kind of had like a little production spot in my townhouse so just in the basement you know like i wasn't really recording too much there it was more of like mixing and production okay. like a little like, couple of overdubs but like i wasn't doing drums or anything major. okay it was more of just like projects that I felt like I was being a little more hands on with, like as a producer, where I'm like, I kind of need to have that space where I'm not paying like an hourly rate to somewhere that like, I, I'm yeah, kinda, that, that's my living room. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I made this like really nice space in my basement and was doing a lot of, you know, like vocal stuff, you know, where we record the whole band at another studio. Yeah. 
but do small dubs and vocals and mixing at the place that I had. Yeah. Um, and I was actually in, in a vocal session with um, Brendan at the time. Yeah, power. And my neighbor came came in like the door you know came flying open and he's like there's a fire there's a fire out back I'm like what like and like yeah just like the whole you know whole place went up then um the, like, there was like two I think two maybe three units just completely you know burned you know what was it um they what was it, it was right before the fourth of July okay. and there was neighbors behind um the, there was houses behind the townhouse complex and okay. nobody really like there's no definite you know proof of anything but i had heard like tons of fireworks like earlier that day from the, the neighbors um and there was like you know the like wooden decks and stuff like that and some you know flower pots and and things like that and i honestly think like uh, a firework got shot over there it was like super dry during that time period mm -hmm. and i think the like, firework what got stuck somewhere in the you know wood of the porch or something like that and okay. just, just started just went up you know did your, your your studio completely went up yeah i mean on it what's really crazy is i didn't really lose any gear um because a, a majority of the fire was all on that outside like at the ground floor and up so okay. any all the damage that was in the basement was mostly water and smoke damage okay and there was some um rescue company um that came up from lancaster that like specializes in salvaging electronic yeah, yeah. gear that's been like water and smoke damaged. And there was these two guys that like were just taking, I mean, I was like a complete wreck. I mean, as you of can course. at that point, like seeing these two guys, just like taking every piece of gear that I had out of this, you know, out of the basement and categorizing it, you know, like writing it down and throwing it in the van. And they're like, yeah, we, you know, 90% sure that we can salvage all your gear. And I'm like, okay, like just, just, in total disbelief that this was even possible you know i thought yeah. everything was just gone and um yeah i got it back in about uh, about a month i got it back and like i said like i i, I didn't lose anything that was anything of value put it that way okay you know, little small things i can't even remember what they were and, and yeah and you you uh left with your life <laughs> yeah 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 and at that point i i was already looking at a bigger spot at that point i was like uh -huh. i need to get out of here like this had this had worked for a time but i was already looking at like getting out of there yeah so that was just more of like a major like okay like i need to figure out yeah. what i'm doing here you know? yeah but then i i, I don't so you know were, you guys were recording back backup really vocals you guys were recording backup vocals what was uh Ro bob's robert what was his studio was that oh, after seven after seven and is that where you were at? Is that where yeah. you were in the set? So yeah, we were doing like gang vocals or something. Yeah, like that. yeah, yeah. Okay, I do remember. I don't know that I remember. I didn't. I didn't pay in, so they, they wouldn't let me sing. <laughs> Are you? <laughs> Are you serious? I'm kidding. Oh, uh, I, I just read mud. No, I didn't. I didn't right? sing because I didn't. In other words, the pay in was like month prior. You you, you invested in the CD, and then you uh, you were part of the gang vocal. Oh God, it was so yeah. it was like one of those like a. Uh, um, uh, like fund, fundraising crowdfund thing. funding yeah okay gotcha, gotcha. yeah it That's wasn't that i didn't i didn't i didn't believe in their uh their artistry <laughs> yes <laughs> this, that is a, the first time i met uh kill me sink guys too so oh, okay Definitely. anyway so that was that that was uh so around the same time you're also playing in a band i guess in the mid mid 2000s um you were in uh grantham road yeah so yeah, what yeah. is that all about? What was that all so about? Well, that's when I kind of started taking, you know, playing and especially bass playing, bass playing more seriously at that point. Okay. Um, I think like out, out of school and like, you know, go, we're interning at the studio in Lancaster and then moving up to here and doing all that. You know, my focus is 100% on the studio. Like, I mean, I had played for fun, you know, myself, but like I wasn't really interested in like joining a band or that just wasn't my focus, you know, or, yeah. or priority at the time. And then... Um, they had actually there was a band called Grantham Road um, that actually came into the studio to do um, at the time we were doing the Central PA Christmas compilation album that um, Terry I don't, Terry Selders and yes. Jeff were very heavily involved yeah with. yeah mutual friend Terry Selders hi yeah Terry. yeah okay <laughs> yeah <laughs> um, so we were yeah. doing that and like Grantham Road was I think a, a four piece band at the time that was going through a bunch of stuff like two of the members like just weren't into it they were having a lot of turmoil. Um, so they had left and, um, Jeff and Terry really had liked this, um, the lead singer of Grantham Road, his name's Flint. 
um, really liked his voice and just like the whole vibe of everything. And they're like, you know, like we like what you've already done, but it was like, it's kind of like, you know, amateur, like beginner, like, you know, if you if we actually produced you and actually, you know, their whole thought was having Terry and Jeff involved, like could do like a really, you yeah. know, really re nice representation of this, this band and like get them to a point that it's something like really marketable, you know? Yeah. So they got this slot on, on the Christmas album. And um, basically, you know, the band ended up being, you know, the drummer and, and um, Flint, you know, the lead singer. Um, and then me on bass and Jeff doing background vocals and more guitars. And Who is Jeff? Jeff Feltenberger. Okay. Of the Badly. The Badly. Yeah. Because, yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, Jeff and I had done tons of work together at that point where yes. he was producing and overseeing things. And and I, I didn't know he was a producer until I yeah. read your, your stuff. Oh, yeah. Yeah. We, him and I have produced a lot of like band and like singer songwriter albums together yeah. for, over the years. Um, um, so we kind of became the band on this recording for them. And I, and I would say, I mean, there was a couple standout tracks on that album, but I think that the song that we had done got a little bit more interest, you know, commercially in like radio play, you know, at the time of Christmas anyway. Um, mm -hmm. So then Terry was like, this is exactly like what we wanted. This is kind of the whole plan, you know? So then he started booking them and really marketing them. And they're like, well, we need a band. Like we need <laughs> yeah, yeah. to do all this stuff. So they're like, hey, like you want to just play you know, bass for a couple months, you know, until we figure out what we're doing and that lasts kind, of ride, four years. kind of ride this wave. And honestly, it's the same exact thing that happened to Hybrid Ice years later then too. Yeah. I was supposed to join Hybrid Ice for two to three months, you know, as a, as a temporary member. And then that turned into 10 plus years, you know, yeah. <laughs> but, um, but that's ended with the same thing with Grantham Road. Like, I'm like, yeah, sure. I'll go out and do a couple of shows with you and all that. And then I ended up really loving it, like really enjoyed getting back out there. And from the studio aspect, like you kind of, you're under a microscope so much and a lot of it as much as i do try to keep like live recording and real a lot of it's just piece by piece you know so mm -hmm. you some of that interaction so like getting out and playing with like people again it felt incredible you know and it yeah. felt really good to do that and i was like i kind of miss this aspect that i didn't really think about for so long yeah, yeah. um so we did that and like you know i, I honestly do you have, a, do you have, a, do you have a stake in any of the writing of that uh, no, I don't. There was a couple songs I had like songwriter credit on, I believe. Um, and I, that's kind of how I got into producing as well. I, I feel like in bands, I was, I don't really write myself. Like, I don't write, like, here's a new song idea. Yeah. I've always, been the, I've always been the guy in bands that the singer, the, the, the writer, whoever the writer is, will, will bring in these ideas or these song ideas that aren't completely finished. Yeah. And then I'm the one that ends up like, oh, well, we should do this and do this. And like, you should play this part. And, and not like, a, like, you know, not like a dictator. I mean, that's what, what that's like, the producer everyone's, does. everyone's sitting there kind of like, oh, this is a cool song. We don't have to do with it. And I'm like, oh, we should try this and try this. And that's kind of been like my role in a lot of the bands, I, especially original bands that I've been yeah. in. Um, which I think is also furthered myself into the, the producing, you know, career and stuff like that. Cause exactly what a producer does kind of. Yeah. Um, but then, so yeah, did the Grantham road thing. Um, and so, and we had a lot of great opportunities and I think all that was going in the right direction for what Terry had set up, you know, mm -hmm. the, the plan to be and the goal. Uh, but then unfortunately, you know, events of, you know, what happens in bands <laughs> yeah. kind of happen, you know, and everything kind of, you know, unraveled very quickly. Mm -hmm. Um, and at that point I was like, kind of, you know, it's kind of like, God, like I've spent all this time putting my making this like my priority and focus for so long and I was still doing the studio thing yeah but it was just a 50 50 thing and I felt like I wasn't doing the studio as much as I would have liked mm -hmm. so coming out of that I was just like no more like I'm just I'm making the studio 100% my priority like I don't need to be in this this whole band situation thing. You, you have to be uh your success re relies on three or four others yeah and it's like you have yeah. a lot to, to to make the right choices and to be on the same page yeah and there's a lot of things out of your control yes you know? and that's scary <laughs> yeah. yeah um so at, so at that portion of time moving forward i was just like i'm i'm focusing on the studio 100 percent and, and all that you know yeah um and then um it, you know, when guess, did you when did you first get into pro tools well, I mean, that was, I mean, first in full sale. I mean, that's the really the first I had. Pro Tools. That's what they, that's what they used. Yeah. I mean, Pro Tools is pretty big. I mean, there was other, other programs as well at full sale, but Pro Tools is the biggie. I mean, of course, I mean, it's one of the 
the bigger programs used um, in the industry. Um, but then I bought Pro Tools coming out of college. And, and that's one, it's something that, you know, interns ask me sometimes, like, how long did it take you to, you know, like, you can fly around on Pro Tools so quick and you know all these like crazy <laughs> behind the scenes things, you know? And I was like, I literally looked at Pro Tools every day from the time 10, I got 10,000 hours. Yeah, I mean, like, I bought Pro Tools and like when I was at home, if I wasn't moving pianos or doing whatever at, at, at the you know studio, I was at home on Pro Tools, like do, just recording myself, just doing, I'm like, I, I wanna do this weird edit. Like, how would I do this? How do I figure this out, you know? And, yeah. And that just turned into, you know, a year or two of doing that. And then I'm like, okay, now my start, my stuff started to sound a lot better at that point. You know, I started to kind of get more of an ear and a know-how to bring that stuff to life a little bit more, you know, so mm -hmm. it's literally just sitting in front of it and doing it every day. Okay. So here's a question for you. Okay. What, what is the role of the, how do you, what do you view the role of the producer to be? Um. I mean, there's, I've taken different roles in different aspects, you know, I think that can be a lot of different things. Um, sometimes I think a producer needs to be like more hands-on, you know, and more like almost like a member of the band, like a temporary member of the band um, and have, you know, have a lot of suggestions and have, you know, a lot of different ideas on things to change, you know, but you never want to change things for the sake of just changing them. And then other, you know, other times um, it's just kind of there as, helping the person being almost more of like a support role you know where like the person doesn't need as much of a producer um you know so it can it can change quite a bit you know and i think there's times where you you, you can kind of lay back and let them do their thing um it's when they get frustrated you know maybe they can't get the take they want or they can't they can't figure out what they want it's where you kind of need to step in and like give them some alternatives so they don't get frustrated you know yeah. kind of take take the brunt of that workload off of them you know, yeah. um, but no, I think, I mean, that, that's, a, I mean, it's a hard question to answer. Cause I think nowadays a producer can mean so many different things at so many yeah. different levels, you know, but I guess, I guess for me, it's just like taking someone's idea, what they come in with, listening to what they want, listening to what the, their ideas and expectations and, and vision is, um, and try to figure out how to do that. You know, like, here's my suggestions. Here's what I'm kind of thinking, or also opening up the door to some possibilities they never thought about. Cause that's actually been, Mm -hmm. the best answer in in the end result is like taking the song somewhere they didn't even think about taking it and they're like this is way better than what i was ever you know and it's like sometimes that complete 180 is like the answer for the song you know so you talk about jeff feltenberger uh teaching you uh the abstract sense of producing and this is what you're you're talking about not necessarily all pressing lots of buttons and all this business but that's what you're talking about yeah, yeah. I mean, I think Full Sail taught me a lot of like the technical aspect and the button pushing and what this gear mm -hmm. does and all that, you know. And um, you know, and, and and Bill Grabowski was more so just watching how a studio was kind of run a little bit, you know, and just like watching him push the button, you know, come like, oh, like I know what that piece of gear does. I see he's pushing that or turning that knob, and it's like I know what he's doing, but I'm, I'm listening, you know. So I was kind of more of that type of learning mm -hmm. with Jeff it was more like the first time I really worked with because I was like assisting under him I was doing the engineering and the technical stuff um, but he was producing and like seeing the some of the things that he was trying to get the artists to do and like listening for you know the pocket and all that and that's the thing like we weren't we weren't really taught about that you know like the groove and like how yeah there's a metronome and there's a click and you want everything to be tight but like sometimes like that human aspect of it not being tight is exactly what you're going for you know mm -hmm especially in this day and age of everything being quantized and on the grid and all that, like working with somebody like Jeff and his background was more about like the, the pocket and the feel and the vibe you, sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Do you still have recording sessions that are not, not dealing with the grid? Do you just getting musicians in a room? Yeah, sometimes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I've done a couple of things without um, uh, a click or a grid lately. Um, one, one of the, I mean, we are doing this with a live, a, live performing. Yeah, like, I mean, we, like, like they used to do. Yeah, yeah, and that's one thing I, mean, I actually have gotten really, really into just recently. The one project I'm working with, um, we ba we're using Pro Tools, but we're we're treating it like a tape machine. Like we're not doing any editing, editing, any, any editing or copying and pasting or anything like that. It's all very, very natural takes, like drums, bass, guitar. Um, we're going back and adding more guitar, like layers and stuff like that, and redoing vocals and adding tons of 
vocals on top, but like the majority, the core is all live with no editing, just completely on. That's kind of rare. It is, and I'm totally embracing this because I love yeah. it. It feels yeah, yeah. really, really good. It, it feels absolutely amazing to be working like this, you know. And it it creates limitations and it creates thing issues where you're like, oh, I could just easily do this and fix all this. But it's like the idea that we're not doing it. I think it just adds so much character and a really human feel to it that I feel like a lot of music um, just it loses sometimes from doing all the editing and all the quantization and stuff. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes. Every every studio I have like in my earlier years, like when I first got introduced to uh, uh, Pro Tools, every studio we were ever in never recorded the band live. We were always the first band to do that. Really? Wow. That's that's, that's, that's how rare it kind of yeah, is. Yeah, it really is. It really is. At, yeah. At, um, so, okay, so you're building you're building your studio or your 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 career in in being an engineer, being a producer, being uh, uh, other people's dreams, musical dreams to life. Somewhere along the line, you get asked to be the temporary bass player for Hybrid Ice. Explain how that ha- explain how that happened. So, yeah, I actually remember that phone call too. Um, well, because I knew, I mean, obviously, I knew Bob um, from working at the studio, and I had re- I recorded the foundation tracks for the third album that they started doing at that time frame. So, like, I had met the band, I knew the guys, and I think I'd even done their live sound once or twice for them when their normal sound guy couldn't make it. Okay. So I was kind of familiar with them. And then their longtime, you know, bass player, Jeff Willoughby, uh, was just kind of like, hey, I'm, I'm done. You know, like I've, I've reached the point where I'm done of being out in clubs at two o'clock in the morning, you know, and, you know, it's been a good fun ride, but I'm bowing out, you know. And then- our, our, our uh, listeners need to know that Hybrid Ice has a history that goes, Sam and Old Man, it goes back to like 1974. Yeah, that's when the band originally, yeah. I, I was in I was in kindergarten then. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that's how well, old the band is. What's that? They, they are, they are an, uh, in our area. They're they've been around forever. Yeah, Rusty always joked that his one uh, Les Paul that he used on stage was from the same year I was born. Um, so that was always that was always a nice highlight. In the- well, he had also he had also been playing in Hybrid Ice the same year you were born. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, so uh so they they got you in how well yeah so they called me and um they're like hey we want to keep playing but like you know uh, our you know jeff he wants to kind of just bow out and, and be done and they were like they thought they had somebody else lined up and they were at the time they were really concerned about finding somebody else their own age um i guess they're like oh we just don't want some young kid up there to look funny you know whatever you know and i guess at that time i was like 29 or 30 or something like that um and I guess it was just a, te- you know, like I said, even the way they were looking at it, they just like wanted somebody temporary for the time being. And they're like, oh, well, Jason, he, you know, we all like him. Like he, he knows us, you know, it'll be a good fit, you know. Um, and um, so I, I signed on for two or three months and I, I didn't even really want to do that, to be honest. I kind of was like, oh, like, I'm not really sure. I have all this other stuff going on at the studio. And like, just what I told myself before, um, you know, I was like, I don't want to get wound up in another band and whatever but i figured this would be like a safer i was like it's hybrid ice like they have they have such a history mm-hmm. and i was like i shouldn't be I, sh- I shouldn't say no to this i feel like it's a really bad <laughs> career move just given that it's hybrid ice you know and to have the opportunity to to get in that that camp and do all what mm-hmm. they do um so i said yes i'll do it and then i actually played my last show thinking that was it like that we we're done and i i guess um they were going into rehearsals with this other guy and things just weren't working out with like scheduling and it just it just wasn't a, a smooth transition and got the call again uh, you know i think i was doing something with building my studio in the basement um i remember like walking outside like being hot and sweaty because i was putting like insulation in the walls and stuff like that and I walked outside and they're like hey do you just want to be like in the band <laughs> and i'm like okay i mean i've already put in all the work i've learned, i know all the songs so <laughs> Sure, why not? You know, and how many kinda... songs is all the songs? Oh, good God! <laughs> that they they have, they have quite a catalog of stuff. Yeah, yeah, that's um, got to be in the I hundreds. Mean, we, we would typically go out and do a three-hour show, you know, which I feel like is kind of unheard of. Like being, you know, like a lot of people like 
we'll do multiple bands and you go out and play an hour, you know, but we would do three hours, you know, stuff. Um, and then not, and still not even play all our material, you know what I mean? So yeah, there was tons and tons, tons of songs on our list that we kind of just had to have ready at any, you know, like there were yeah. core, core songs that were like, we know we're going to do these, but there was always like, you know, 15 to 20 songs that maybe we didn't play all that often, but could be put into rotation at any time, you know? And like I said, these aren't the easiest songs. Even some no, none of them are easy songs. Kansas and, you know, yes. So if you had to be, yeah, if you were in a cover band, if you were in a cover, that is the cover band you want to be in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah because yeah. everything is a learning experience. There is nothing yeah. easy about any of their yeah, stuff. Yeah, and there was nothing planned as much because I'd always be so. What's you know what's the plan? What's the set list? It's like they're like we don't have a clue. Like we like we think it's going to start like this, but like after we you know, after like so it was like you always had to be on your toes. You yeah. always. I mean, it was always a very stressful thing for me. I always felt like even after being in the band, you know, ten years, like I still felt like the new guy. You know, I still feel like I always had to keep up my standard because those guys are amazing players, you know, and, and musicians. So I'm like, I got to I got to keep up with my game, you know, and, you know, always be on point. You know, so it was a pretty stressful thing, you know, like it, if they would throw a song into the mix, it's like, holy crap. Like, I haven't played that in a while. I'll be back in the dressing room just trying to, you know, get, get yeah. my crap together, you know, and make sure yeah. I can do a good job. I would not be that guy who did a good job. <laughs> <laughs> I, I rely too much on improvisation and I'm, I'm i'm feeling that the the songs that you would have to learn there's not a whole lot of room for that <laughs> yeah no 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 yeah, yeah they're definitely not i guess one thing you know and there's a lot to say for like an improv and improv yeah. approach yes because uh, i'm not i'm not good at that avenue at all at that yeah, yeah. At all. you know that's, I, that's, and, and that's kind of like more hybrid ice's thing is like this is what we're doing like you learn it pretty much note for note you know yeah. that was her whole idea of being a tribute slash cover band you know is yeah. that you do it right you know so the other things uh they had their own original material they weren't just a cover band yeah yeah that's the thing and then they have, have one of their songs i know one of their songs boston, boston. Yeah, Ma yeah magdalene ended up being on um boston's third album okay um, which is funny if you go out and look at like a lot of the you know boston forums or you know whatever people you can find a lot of people writing and, and talking about and discussing that song yeah um how it, people have discovered hybrid ice's version you know not knowing who hybrid ice is and they're like i mean i kind of forget how i'm paraphrasing how they said it but a lot of people didn't like boston's version of the song compared to hybrid ice's yeah. version. hybrid ice's version just sounded kind of like a sticks meets journey kind I, of pow power ballad you know for yeah. that time period and who was, who was the lead singer on that for uh Magdalene. Magdalene, yeah um chris chris Alberger. okay yeah he's got a high voice oh my oh, god he does he does and he can re he can sound like all the like when we do stick stuff he could sound just like the guys from sticks you know okay. all, all that type of stuff yeah. yeah um but uh but yeah boston made it more into like a a big like boston. almost like space odyssey like exploration kind of thing you know yeah um but uh and it, it's you know it's great i mean not to take anything away from it it, it, it took away from that just four minute power ballad that it yeah. was you know yeah but it, yeah but they bought the rights for it and it ended up on the third album yeah that's wonderful that's wonderful okay so this this opportunity to play with uh to play with hybrid ice also led to various different like rock cruises because yeah. the, the, yeah. tribute, the tribute kind of aspect and the fact that you guys are so good at learning stuff, note perfect. So you got, you got a chance to play with all these uh, people that were resurrecting their careers. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and I, I think, you know, it's pretty easy to see like in the last couple of years, um, you know, even before COVID and all that, like yeah. um, people were doing these like rock cruises, you know, where you get like seven or eight like singers or bands, you know, from the eighties or nineties or you know whoever. And they go out and do these like rock cruises. And a lot of these people were just the lead singers of these yeah. groups. And well, it made it, made it a lot easier and like kept the, you know, the, the count down for the, the people that were working, you know, like, like the, the production the band member and production, just keep it simpler, yeah. um, is to, you know, have one core backing band. Yeah. That kind of just did everybody's stuff and it just kept it more confined and like our setups were a lot easier and stuff yeah. like that. Um, but yeah, yeah. Working with, um, Jimmy Jameson of, um, survivor, survivor, you know, and Kevin Chalfant was, um, 
he had his own band called the storm but he was also very well known for doing like journey tribute type stuff okay um and um derek st holmes from ted nugent and uh-huh. john cafferty um was a, was a big one that we played with a lot the um, beaver brown yeah the beaver brown band yeah, okay. yeah so we were like the fake beaver brown band <laughs> okay you were a beaver brown <laughs> yeah yeah um but yeah those were like those were great the band a very good row and was it sim yeah yeah sim, um i forget how you pronounce Hassian or Hassian. yeah yeah Hassian. Um, yeah, but uh, yeah, Barry Goudreau and Sib. Yep, yep. You were, um, you were, you were the you were the the Boston people of that. Uh, the Boston, yeah, we were the, the Boston tribute band with the the two members of Boston. The yeah. most authentic Boston tribute yeah. band ever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah. but that was a fun, that was probably the highlight of of that. You know, for so me, your your like, abilities. Yeah. Did you did you ever get any charts from any of these people? No, no, absolutely not. No, I mean that no, was no written music. <laughs> No, and they're like, we like, fine. like, well, how do you end these songs? Like, how do you do? And they're like, ah, like, well, we, sometimes we do it this way, and sometimes we do it this way. And like, our sound check was literally like having twenty minutes to be like, what songs do you guys have questions about? Like, what do you guys want to go over? We're like, yeah. oh, like, <laughs> like a lot. We want to go over a lot, but yeah. like, what, what's the most important things in twenty yeah. minutes? You know, and that like, we would go on and do these shows with like never really having any practice with them, other than just. So that you know, is a skill that is a skill into itself. Yeah, 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 yeah. And there's a lot of just watching YouTube videos too of like of them performing in the last year or two. It's like, well, how did they do this? How did they end this song? How did they do this? Or, you know, and just being prepared as you possibly can be walking into these situations. You know? So having a good ear is part of the part of the gig. Probably I would have to guess, like anything else, not being a pain in the butt, being a good hang. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And just the yeah, whole yeah, business yeah. aspect of how am I going to make this easier and, and, and better for the and enjoyable for the person that you're playing with? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, that might, yeah. Lots of people don't know that there's lots of stuff that goes on. Uh, not everything is a uh, chops and music. Theory. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Personality is a big, a big thing. And just like being, you know, people skills and all that. And yeah. being able to, to read people's personalities like quickly, you know, sometimes of kind of getting a vibe of like, Oh, like, I think this is kind of how this guy operates, like going along this way. Or like, if I have a question, like posing the question this way versus this way is going to make a difference to whether I'm bugging this guy or whether he's going to show that I'm taking the initiative that I, I actually care. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so just, yeah, like, you know, you know, people skills is very important in this industry all around. Yeah. Yes, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. So who are you recording now? What are you doing right now? Um, a couple projects. Uh, well, one I just wrapped up in December. Um, Adam Gingrich. I was super excited about his album. Uh, we worked on that through like October, November, December. Um, and the other one that's kind of currently in the works is Observe the 93rd. That's the one that I was saying about okay. um, kind of taking the more like the live aspect and like and, like no editing and no, you know. Yeah. Just, oh, that's that's the live band? That's them. Yep. That's yep. wonderful. Yep. I know those guys. Yep. They're wonderful. Yep. Yeah. So when I get, you know, Derek and I, what ended up happening was kind of getting into that. We did a Halloween song. That's how it all started. He's like, I just want to do this like really off, like kind of different than anything we've done before. I saw Derek on Halloween. Oh, did you? <laughs> he was in the, the dead tribute band. Oh, that's right. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so we did one song kind of like that, you know, and then um, the, the Beatles thing, the get back came out uh, in November and like, we got obsessed over that documentary. I came here. You know? And um, like, we were kind of already in like that aspect. I mean, that's kind of like my background anyway. I mean, I'd always loved it to be more real and authentic than, ed- and, you know, having editing and yes. trickery involved. But I mean, obviously you're always going to have some of that. But like getting into that, talking more about that with Derek and then that documentary coming out, we both just got obsessed and we're like, these next couple of songs he wanted to do and all that, just having a different feel and a different vibe. We're like, these songs need to be recorded like that. Like, I think it's just kind of us both you know, stepping up our game maybe and just kind of, you know, knowing we're going to make it harder on ourselves, but thinking that it's going to be more rewarding being, you know, the end result and the goal is going to be more reward, reward yeah. doing it that way, you know? Yes. That's wonderful. That's so, wonderful that they're, that they're the band that you, uh, you go back to real, I, I say real recording. I sound like a boomer, <laughs> but it's like, like, well, no, my, my position historically we'll say, cause I'm, I'm opening up to the, the reason, why why the grid is important to certain kinds of music yeah absolutely absolutely so but uh what excites me is musicians in a room yeah absolutely yeah yeah There's interacting, something- interacting. Yeah. whenever you can whenever you can uh make that happen 
it's a good day for me. Exactly. Yeah. Not yeah. always can musicians because of because of the things that recording is where recording has gone. Sometimes that's not possible because people can't make it sound because we have all these safeguards in the recording that it doesn't always sound as good. Yeah. But, yeah. but it it lets to record like that. It flexes your muscles and you got to you got to measure up. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. So that's yeah. wonderful. That's wonderful. Thank you, Jason. Thank yeah, you. No problem. Thank any, you for asking me to do this. This is great. Yeah. So, is there anything else you want to say? What are we uh, missing? No, I don't know. I mean, that's. <laughs> I, can talk I know you have. I know you. Yeah, huh? I said I could talk about this stuff for hours. Oh yeah. I mean, okay. So, uh, we 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 yeah. almost forgot to talk about shooting red. That the people need to know about shooting red. I don't know if you remember shooting red, but we recorded together, a teen band. And probably nine two thousand fourteen. Oh. Yeah, we did, we did one song, and it was uh, it turned out to be absolutely fantastic, which I'll probably put a link. I will put oh, a link. Was that, that video. Um, was that through um, Perfect Fifth? Perfect Fifth. Okay. Terry Souders, um, Cal, Cal Weary, myself. We were all working together to make this happen. It was a. Oh, um, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So that was probably one of the highlights of my teaching. Okay, cool. Like in, cool. In, a, in, a, in a week's time, we went from arranging a song to going into the studio. That's right. Yeah. We, yeah. Had, we had six guitar players. One guy made elephant noises. Yeah. <laughs> one, guy strummed two, one guy strummed two measures of open chords. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. No, I do remember. Well, because we did it. It was an original song. No, no, it was a radioactive. Oh, okay. Because I thought there was an original and a cover song. Oh, no, no. We did. We, I, I also recorded with Logan. Logan oh, okay. Better. Yeah. Okay, did. got you, got you. Okay. We did original music there too. So Okay. Oh, cool. Hope to yeah, do I, more. I What's that? I hope to do more. Got, yeah, yeah, absolutely. We'll figure, we'll figure stuff out. So anyway, okay, sure, sure. be well and thank you so much. Hey, thank you. Alrighty.